Hi, I'm Miranda Cosgrove, and this is Mission Unstoppable. Coming up, a glass of water has more science than you might think. Reverse osmosis can remove particles like viruses. That's right, you got it. That's wild to me. And it's our cutest nature side quest yet. Hey, what's up, Joey? He's a good guy. Plus, is there life beyond Earth? This little moon might hold some clues. So grab your travel mug, because I'm about to spill the stem tea. Then, discover how these women are fighting stereotypes and fire. We wouldn't give it up for the world. Get ready to meet the scientists, inventors, and heroes who help make our world a better place. The future is here. The mission unstoppable. An optimist sees a glass of water as half full. A pessimist sees it as half empty. And a director of research for the Orange County Water District sees it as all in a day's work. On this show, we're always thirsty for knowledge. But today, I'm also regular thirsty, which is why I'm here to meet water wizard, Dr. Megan Plumley, director of research at the Orange County Water District here in Southern California. One of my earliest memories of science is when my parents got me a microscope. And I love to collect things and look at them in the microscope. It was really mind blowing to see what the world around you really looks like when you look close. And that's really what got me interested in kind of all the stuff you can't see and how it works. As director of research, Megan leads a team of scientists and engineers bringing water to over 2.5 million people in more than 20 cities. SoCal has always needed water for everything from agriculture to manufacturing to those scenes where an actor cries in the rain. <laughs> Neighboring areas import water hundreds of miles through complicated aqueducts, but an extended drought and warming temperatures could dramatically cut that supply, and soon. But the Orange County Water District provides 85% of their community's drinking water from a naturally occurring groundwater basin. And it's only possible thanks to the cutting edge groundwater replenishment system. Here, treated wastewater, or used water as they call it, that previously was literally wasted and discharged into the ocean, is instead turned into clean, safe, drinkable water to refill the basin. This facility is the largest of its kind in the world. And today, Megan is gonna show me the three technologies that make it possible, starting with ultra filtration. So what is ultra filtration? These hollow fibers, and they're all bundled together. So the used water is on the outside, it goes through the membrane and up and out. Not filters the water? Absolutely. So if there's little particles in the water, even as small as bacteria, they will stay on the outside of the membranes because they're too large to fit through the microscopic tiny, tiny holes in the membrane. A human hair, the width of that, this is like one one thousandth of that. Wow. For the pores. While ultrafiltration was impressive, they take it to the next level with reverse osmosis. So what exactly is reverse osmosis? Yeah, so reverse osmosis or RO, is a purification process where we use very high pressures to push water through a membrane with microscopic pores. You just saw that ultrafiltration process. In this case, the pores are thousands of times even smaller than that. What is osmosis? In natural osmosis, or just osmosis, water through its own natural driving force travel across the membrane towards salty water. It wants to dilute that water. But in this process, we're actually making the water move the opposite way. It's going across the membrane towards the clean, purified water side. At this point, it's nearly drinkable water. The ultrafiltration was removing larger particles like dust, dirt, and bacteria. That's right. Whereas reverse osmosis can remove even smaller particles like viruses. That's right, you got it. That's wild to me. Once the water is checked for things like salinity, it moves on to the final step, ultraviolet light and also hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so you're using UV light That's right. to filter the water. How does that even work? Right, right. So the UV light actually reacts first with the hydrogen peroxide to make hydroxyl radicals, which are really powerful and they break almost any chemical bond that they bang into, essentially. So anything dissolved in the water, like trace impurities, dissolved chemicals, or in the case of something biological, like a cell membrane or DNA, it'll break that up as well, which we really don't expect to be present much at this point at all. Okay. So it's like an extra polishing step. On this scale model, Megan shows me how each of these reactors work. 
water flows in through three vessels, each with 144 UV lamps. Overall, the facility has over 5,000 lamps. Your electricity bill must be crazy. Advanced purification to recycle water actually takes less energy than other options like importing water. While the water from this facility is destined to replenish the groundwater supply, it's still safe, clean, and refreshing, straight from the tap. Megan, thank you so much for a lovely day. You're welcome. I appreciate you teaching me about how water is treated at this mm -hmm. facility. Here's to another day of water sustainability. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. OK, I'm getting hints of ultrafiltration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting notes of um, reverse osmosis and a bouquet of ultraviolet on the finish. That's exactly what we were going for. So Is that right? Thank you. <laughs>
His preferred method for protecting his children involves something called mouth brooding, which is as wild as it looks. But that's an adventure for another time. That's all for now. I'll see you on our next Nature Side Quest. Life on Earth is pretty neat. Like, have you seen an otter? No notes, flawless. With all the diversity and beauty of life on Earth, imagine how cool it would be to find life on other planets or moons here in our solar system. While the icy frost of Mars or the swirling clouds of Venus have potential to foster life, our best bet to find other life might be a little moon called Europa. So grab your travel mug, cause I'm about to spill the stem tea. Jupiter has at least 80 moons, but Europa might be the most interesting one. Sorry to the other 79 moons. I still love you, my little babies. There are a few things about Europa that don't just make it one of the most interesting objects in the solar system, but our best bet to find extraterrestrial life. For one, in our solar system, it's the smoothest solid object we know about. Though scientists have observed long lines and cracks on Europa, it's missing large scale craters or mountains, which indicates the surface is relatively new, much, much younger than the billions of year old surfaces of other moons. This led scientists to believe that the surface of Europa is actually ice. And below that ice, scientists think there's an ocean of liquid water. There aren't a lot of sopping wet moons in our solar system, so Europa is special. You might be thinking, how is there water on Europa? Why isn't it frozen solid? It's far from the sun, and geologically, you'd expect it to have long ago radiated its heat into space. We think Europa is still geologically active, with a molten core, because of what's called tidal flexing. The close side of Europa is more affected by Jupiter's gravity than the moon's far side. But since Europa has an elliptical orbit, that difference varies. This pulls and stretches the moon, causing the tidal flexing. This friction from this movement could be creating enough heat to keep Europa's core warm, which keeps the salty oceans liquid. And while the satellites we've sent to Europa haven't seen this, the Hubble telescope has detected what could be icy plumes of water erupting off its surface. But you need more than just water for life, and Europa might have those ingredients too. All that heat and tidal flexing could drive geothermal activity on Europa's seafloors, not unlike the hydrothermal vents deep in the oceans of Earth. On Earth, these vents expel nutrients and complex chemicals essential to life, and deep sea microbes have evolved to feed on those chemicals. These microbes form the base of a food web, not based on photosynthesis energy from the sun, but instead from what's called chemosynthesis. No sun needed, which is great when you're below 15 miles of ice. But you know those plumes we talked about earlier? They might provide a way for satellites to sample the water from Europa's moon without drilling down through 15 miles of rock hard ice. There are missions from NASA and the European Space Agency being prepped to study Europa and the large moons of Jupiter in more detail, but they won't be there until after 2030. If we discover that life evolved twice independently in a single solar system on both Earth and Europa, it could mean that in places with the right ingredients, life is fairly common throughout the galaxy and beyond. If there's not extraterrestrial life on Europa, it just means life on Earth is even more precious than we thought which I'm fine with. Sometimes it's nice to feel special. Firefighters have a reputation as heroes, but is that accurate? Yep, sure is. And they do some science too. We sent Erica to Colorado to learn more. You always hear people say, when I grow up, I wanna be a fireman. But what if you wanna be a firewoman? Well, you can. And that's why I'm visiting the Golden Fire Department in Colorado. Their team has 77 firefighters, of which 21% are women. We all love it. None of us want to do anything else. We wouldn't give it up for the world. To get in on the fun, I met with Melissa Wynn and this unique team of firefighters. Hi! Hello! The first step, bunking up or getting in the gear. Just say, this looks like a lot of stuff. <laughs> I'm gonna wear all of this? All of this eventually. We'll get there, step by step, okay? We start with heavy fire retardant pants. 
seems easy, except... I'm seeing shoes inside of pants yes. there. Our whole goal is to be able to get into our gear in under a minute. To fully protect themselves, these outfits have to withstand temperatures of up to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So all this has been yep. designed really specifically. Specifically to help us sit in a fire for as long as we need to. I grab my tools of the trade and we hop into the truck to hurry over to our simulated disaster. We're gonna use a hose to connect the hydrant to the truck. And then the truck itself is going to aid in controlling our water pressures. By pulling water from the hydrant into the truck and using the truck to regulate pressure, firefighters are able to control both the water pressure and how many hoses they can use to douse the flames. For volunteer Captain Tina, this part of the job is something she's very familiar with. I'm an electrician, actually, and so I know pumps. So first thing first, when they get the hydrant, I have to make sure I can check and see what my pressure is, what's coming off my hydrant. I can have a lot of lines coming off my truck. So then I have to do all the math through all the lines and make sure we have enough water coming out of the truck. Within minutes of arriving on site, Tina has to finalize her calculations, accounting for dozens of variables, including gravity. But are we going upstairs or are we going downstairs? Because if we're going up, I need to put five more PSI on the uh, pump. Suddenly, I hear Captain Kehoe over the radio. Everyone's on the fairground, we have a person a victim on the first floor. Sounds like a mission for a new trainee. So firefighter Amelia walks me through my first rescue. First thing that we do is we check the conditions of the room using our thermal imaging camera. What this does is it takes temperature readings off of different objects and then creates a digital image based off of those temperature readings. So even in a pitch black environment, we'd be able to see without typical vision. Finding the victim is only the beginning. So this is the webbing. Wow. This tool gives first responders the ability to move bodies that are too heavy to lift out of the danger zone. We secure the webbing to our victim and pull her to the exit. If this was a real fire, we'd hand her off to a nearby team for medical treatment. But that was really cool. Now Captain Kehoe thinks I'm ready for a tougher challenge. So it's time to add some fake smoke to the mix. All right, we're gonna get some smoke in the building. So there's gonna be a lot of decreased visibility. So we're gonna send our crews in to find our victim. The smoke may be fake, but the difference it makes is real. Even something as simple as putting the webbing on becomes much harder with our vision obstructed. All right, I'm putting the web under her leg. But these pros work quickly. And then we're ready to go. That was not any easier the second time I have, but that was really cool. What I've learned today is that it takes strength, determination, and science to be a firefighter. So my 10 pound hat goes off to these women. Thank you so much for having me. And so cool to see the amount of STEM that's involved. This has definitely inspired me. You wanna join our team? <laughs> Give me a moment to think about that when I'm not wearing this. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Before we go, we have one last thing. I think advice that I would give to young kids thinking about a career in science is to really keep an open mind. You know, the thing that maybe you're not so fond of at first, maybe in school, could be something you love as a career later on. My advice is to all of the young women who want to come into the fire department or come into STEM is you're, you're welcome here and you're, you're wanted and we're excited to have you. That's it for Mission Unstoppable. See you next time, bye. If you're watching this, you must have really liked the video. Make sure you follow and subscribe and check out these other videos that are even better. No, really, I've seen this one over a hundred times.